<coughs> okay, let's finish the, this, uh, this chapter. <coughs> we have been talking about the representations of uh, extended supersymmetry. We did first the massless case. And for the massless case, we found um, the structure of the multiples, and we found that in general, a multiplet has a has a two to the n states, and uh, <coughs> and the reason we got this is because we had the the two generators the the Q's, the Q's, Q1 and Q2. And we had that, uh, because it was a massless uh, state, that we had a Q2 equals, equal to zero. So we generated all the states by uh, defining a combination of uh, Q's and Q bars in terms of uh, defining that the uh, A's and A daggers, which are creation and annihilation operators. And from applying that creation operator to the vacuum state, we generated all these two to the n states. And uh, for that, <coughs> we didn't have to use at all the fact that this algebra, the extended supersymmetry algebra, had uh, the central charges. The reason is was that central charges They were coming from the algebra of the Q alphas <coughs> and Q betas. And uh, since Q2, Q2 was zero, when you plug that into here, the only, the only value that the central charges can take within a representation is also zero, because when you, you have Q1, Q2, acting on any state at the end implies a set equal to zero. So Q2 equal to zero implies that Z, the set were zero within the representation, so we didn't have to worry about the central charges at all for the massless case. And uh, <coughs> okay, so keep these two things in mind, that we had Q2 equal to zero, implied that we, we created a states out of Q1 and then Q1 bars, actually, that gave us the two to the n states, and that z was zero. So that's what we have to remember for what I'm going to say now. So for the massive case, which is what I will discuss today, for the massive case, the situation will be different, because uh, as uh, we have uh, seen from the massive case, we pick a momenta to be M000. <coughs> and then the algebra, the Q alpha and Q bar uh, beta dot, let's take with the A here and a B there which was uh, two times uh, sigma mu alpha beta dot p mu. This uh, <coughs> becomes uh, simply, since p mu is, is n, only for n equal to zero, this becomes two m times the identity matrix in the, um, I'm sorry, there was a, this was a delta a b. Also here. <coughs> okay, so that means that we, as, as in the n equals to one case, we have now the entries here both are different from zero, whereas in the massless case we have one of them equal to zero and the other one different from zero. So in this case, what we will have <coughs> is that uh, we, we will have both q, q1 and q2 giving us uh, creation and annihilation operators, so we double the number of, of, uh, of states. And uh, 
and then that will be uh, the case of the, then that will change the uh, implications we had for the central charges. That means that now the central charges do not have to be zero. Before they were zero because this part was zero, this entry was zero. Okay, so now they are not zero. So we have to consider two cases. One is uh, let's take the case where the central charges are zero, that's the possibility. And then after that, we take the, the z different from zero. Okay, for if the central charges are equal to zero, then we have essentially the same situation as in the n equals to one, except that, uh, um, that uh, we have now the, the, uh, the ma many generators in, in the, Because of the of the so we define <coughs> a alpha a to be q alpha a over square root of two m, and those are creation and uh, these are annihilation operators, and, and the dagger will be the corresponding creation operators, and so from here. We know that, that uh, since alpha goes from 1 to 2, you will have, <coughs> for each value of alpha, you will have uh, n um, generators. So we have 2n in this case. Okay, That's the difference we had we have with the massless case, where we had only n, n, n uh, um, creation operators. Now we have 2n creation operators. <coughs> And uh, so this implies that uh, that will give us 2n creation and annihilation operators. And that will give us, at the end, 2 to the n states for, if we count only the, the, the number of, of uh, independent generators, but for each state, Each of dimension two y plus one. So at the end we have two to the n times two y plus one. Two y plus one was remember is the f for spin y we have uh, the generacy two y plus one. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> that means that we have two to the n times two y. So 2 to the 2n times 2y plus 1 states. We have a lot of states. <coughs> I will give you, just as an example, just uh, the, I will just write it. For n equals to 2, we have, we start with the, Omega, so that is that is y equal to zero, and the spin is zero, and the number of states is one. Then when we act a dagger, <coughs> a say alpha on omega, this will have spin one half, and there will be four states, because alpha goes from one to two, and a also goes from one to two. And uh, then we will have uh, a dagger, a dagger acting on omega with our corresponding indices that will, I will not write, then we have three particles of a spin zero and three of a spin one. In total, that will give us six. And where we add a dagger, a dagger, a dagger on omega, we'll have again spin one half, four states, and we saturate everything with four. 
again, that will give us a spin zero and one state. So in total, when we add the number of states, that will be 16. And 16 happens to be 2 to the power 2n. n equals to 2, 2 to the 4 is 16. Okay. The detailed construction of this, uh, uh, I, I, I won't, I won't uh, bother too much just to give you an idea how big the multiplet is. Okay. And the fact that we have spin 0 and spin 1 here is because, again, when you multiply objects of, of a different spin, you have spin 1 half and spin 1 half. That will give you spin 1 and spin 0, and so on. <coughs> OK, so this is just to give you a taste how, how big the multiplets can be. So this is the, so the multiples are much bigger for the massive cases in n equals to 2. And, uh, sorry, for any n. Okay, so that is uh, the set A B different from uh, equal to zero. Now let's consider the the most generic case for which the central charges are zero, are different from zero. Sorry, and uh, <coughs> this will give us a a very general result that I will try to to derive for you right now. So to consider this case, let us consider the following quantity. <coughs> this is a sophisticated H. Okay. <coughs> okay. And I define this H to be Sigma zero, sigma bar zero, beta dot alpha, Q alpha A minus gamma alpha A. I will tell you what gamma is in a moment. Q bar beta dot A minus gamma bar beta dot A. Anti commutator. And uh, <clears throat> I will define what gamma is in a moment, but at least you will see that the, what this quantity ha carries no, no indices because all the indices are contracted. The beta dot with the beta dot, the alpha with the alpha, and the a's with the a's. So we are, we are, this is just a general trace. And we are multiplying an object times its uh, conjugate. So that means that this quantity is a number which is positive or equals zero. Okay, so that's the important thing is that we are constructing something which is essentially the modulus of a quantity, and so it's, it's, a, it's a positive uh, number. So now I will define what gamma is. Gamma alpha a. <laughs> to be <coughs> epsilon alpha beta uab q bar gamma dot b sigma bar zero gamma dot beta. Okay, so gamma is written in terms of the of the q bars times this uh, u, where u is, a, is an arbitrary unitary matrix. <coughs> okay. So, and as usual, the sigma zeros are here just to keep the consistency on the index notation with the, bit, with the dotted and undotted indices. Because remember that sigma zeros are just identity matrix in, in two dimensions. <clears throat> okay. So I'm defining uh, this quantity, and let's see what actually the value of this uh, h is. <clears throat> it's any unitary matrix. So the moment is arbitrary. arbitrary. I, I will do something with it in a second, but the moment is arbitrary. Okay. 
Okay, so you see the supersymmetry algebra. Because we know that we can use Q times Q bar, we know what it is. And gamma times uh, gamma bar, we can use also the algebra of the Qs and so on. And the Q times gamma, so we know what they are. And uh, so we have the following. H takes the following form. 8 times M, where M is the mass, times capital N, which is the number of supersymmetries, minus two times the trace <coughs> of a set Z U dagger plus U, U Z dagger. Okay. So let me just give you quickly an idea of how these terms come from. Uh, if you consider the Q's and the Q bars, that will give you a 2 coming from the algebra, from uh, this 2. Then since, since we are taking the traces in the two dimensions, so we have another 2 coming from the trace the two dimension, in the two dimensions. So we have 2 times 2 is 4. And, uh, and since we are taking also, also the trace in the capital indices, we have a factor of capital N, so that's N. The N, N comes from the momentum, of course. So we have a 4NN given by this Q and Q bar. Okay? Now with the gammas, when I take the gamma and gamma bar, I use again the same kind of algebra because gamma, gamma will be Q bar essentially and gamma bar will be Q. So you, I use the same algebra and I get the other 4MN. So that gives me the 8MN. Okay. So now I did the easy part and you do the rest. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now the rest is that, is that uh, now you have to take, say, the Qs with the gamma bar. Uh, sorry, the uh, yes, the, the Q with the gamma bar or the gamma with the Q. And and for that you will see that, for instance, the gamma with the the gamma with the I'm sorry, the Q with the gamma bar, we will have Q is Q and gamma bar. Since gamma is written in terms of Q bar, you will have gamma bar will be uh, so they will have a Q here and the U, and then you have the algebra Q times Q that gives you the Z, and that's this term. Okay? Q times Q give you the, uh, the Z, and then you will see how the, the, since I'm taking the bar of this one, I have to use, take U dagger, so that will give me the set U dagger, and the other term, term will give me the U Z dagger. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> and as I told you before, this H, whatever it was, we know, is positive or zero. <coughs> okay, so now I can use the fact that uh, U is arbitrary, so I, I, can, I can play with it. And uh, so I can use something that is called the polar decomposition theorem, or polar decomposition for matrices. That means that any matrix Z can be written as a product of, uh, of two matrices that I will write now, H and, and uh, V. So that's why I wrote that H in that uh, sophisticated way, just to not be confused with this H. Okay. So <clears throat> where H is Hermitian and positive, And V is unitary. Okay, so it's called the polar, polar decomposition of matrices because uh, it will be it generalizes the complex number written as a as a positive quantity times a phase. So the phase is substituted by an, by a unitary matrix, and the positive quantity, the positive, the modulus is given by this uh, positive Hermitian matrix. Sometimes you will see this decomposition instead of the capital H, you write it like e to the something, e to the, e to the Hermitian matrix. So it's something you can look in a linear algebra or matrices books. 
So, but we will use this decomposition because now we we'll write z to be h times v, where v is unitary. And now we are free to choose what that uh, u were, uh, uh, matrix u we had there, which was arbitrary. We can choose it to be equal to v, and that simplifies our life. Okay, that's, that's, that's when, when we have to. <coughs> so now choose u to be equals to, equal to v. And that will, that will tell us that uh, h will be 8 and n. <coughs> so you will see z times u dagger, I will have h v times v dagger. That will give me 1, so I have h. And, uh, and the same thing for the u times z dagger. That will give me v, v dagger, h. So I have h plus h, which is 2h. So I have minus 4 trace of h. <coughs> this, you can prefer to write it like this, 8m n minus 4 trace because that's about it, what uh, h is. So this is interesting to be able to take the square root of, uh, of a matrix, but it's essentially what we mean is precisely this, because we know that h is positive. And again, this is different. This is uh, greater or equal to 0. And uh, this is the result we wanted. So that means that. This implies that this difference is positive or zero, so th that means that m, if I, yes, m has to be greater or equal than the trace of uh, h divided by um, two. N. Okay. And this is uh, the result we were after. And I will tell you why this is important. This is a bound. M, remember, is the mass. It's a bound on the mass of the particles. The par mass of the particles has to be greater than something. So, <clears throat> and this bound is usually called the BPS bound. where uh, BPS is for Bogol, Molny, Prasad, and Sommerfeld, who first found this kind of bound in, uh, in field theories, not related with supersymmetry at all. <coughs> and you will see that this is interesting. So this is a BPS bound. That means that the masses have to be greater than a certain quantity determined by the central charges. Any questions so far? <clears throat> yes? How do you determine the central, the central charge? Oh, oh, you, we will see examples in a moment, and then, yes. <clears throat> OK. So, uh, so th then that means that we have that bound. And uh, the bound is saturated. When m, of course, is equal to that, and for the states that satisfy this relationship, when the mass equal to that, these are usually called BPS states. <coughs> so these are particular states where this is uh, uh, satisfied. 
These BPS states are very important and are important for uh, several reasons. But uh, the property uh, that, the, that uh, makes them special is as follows. When you have the bound saturated, the, this, that means that this is an equality equal to zero, we can go back to our starting point, and our starting point was this uh, anti-commutation relation. When this is equal to zero, that means that this operator by itself is zero, because this is essentially the modulus of the operator. Okay? <coughs> Sorry. So that means that uh, for BPS states, we have a combination of the Qs and Q bars that actually vanishes for all the states. So this reminds us the case that we had for the massless uh, multiplets for which Q2 was equal to zero. So remember, Q2 was equal to zero for the massless case. And because of that, the multiplets in the massless case were of uh, the size was 2 to the n, whereas the generic multiplet in the massive case was uh, 2 to the 2n that I wrote there. The BPS states share a property similar to the massless case because we have not Q2 equal to zero, but a combination of uh, Q and, and Q bars that are equal to zero. So at least we can have uh, a basis where you can have as a, 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 a <coughs> the creation operators or so, an addition operators. Uh, one will be Q minus gamma and the other one will be Q plus gamma. So Q minus gamma will be zero. And then we generate all the states out of Q plus gamma, the, 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 the orthogonal combination. And so that means that we will have a situation similar to the massless case in the sense that instead of having 2 to the 2n states, we will have 2 to the n states. OK, is that, is that clear? So that means that the important thing about the, the BPS states is that the states are shorter than typical massive states. This is very important. So it's better to be clear. Did you get the point that they have to be shorter? Anybody didn't get it? OK, so let me just write it. So for BPS states, the combination Q alpha A minus gamma alpha A is 0. And uh, so this implies the corresponding multiplet is shorter. The number of states, but it will be given by 2 to the n and not 2 to the 2n. <coughs> okay. Okay, so that is, that is the, the main uh, property that actually makes these states special. <coughs> <clears throat> Example, as uh, you were asking, example, let's take the case n equals to 2, which is the simplest case. In this case, the central charge uh, matrix will be just a 2 by 2 matrix. And it has to be anti-symmetric, so you can just write it like, a, like that. I, I will put a, an index on the queues just for convenience for later. So just the central charge is just uh, depends on one parameter that I call Q, which is like a charge. <coughs> so in this case, the condition, the BPS condition, tells us that the mass has to be greater or equal than 1 over 2n, which is 1 over 4. Z dagger Z 
that will give me uh, q1 square q1 square on the diagonal. I take the square root, that will give me q1 q1, and I take the trace, that will give me 2q1. <coughs> So then that this tells us that the mass is greater than the charge divided by two. We call that a charge. <coughs> so this is a, just to emphasize, this is mass, and this is charge. So there's, this is a condition on the mass and the charge of the objects. And of course, for the BPS states, the mass, the mass and the charge will be equal. <coughs> okay. Uh, this, this can be generalized to any other n. So, based on this example, you can have the, for more general case, take n greater than 2, and for convenience, take it even. So, in this case, the matrix set AB can be written as a a set of two by two blocks of the same type as this one. So we have zero Q1 minus Q1 zero, and then zero Q2 minus Q2 zero, and so on. Zero Qn minus Qn zero. And of course the rest will be zero. Okay, so this is, that's why I require n to be even, just to have uh, all, all, all the different uh, blocks to fit in terms of uh, two by two matrices. If n is odd, then you have an extra zero eigenvalue because you cannot add uh, the, the last uh, block, <coughs> but the rest will be identical. So, <coughs> so we have that, and uh, then, since we can write the central charge matrix in a block diagonal way, the condition that I proved here in general, you can do it block by block. Okay, so the n will be greater or equal than this uh, q1 over 2n, and then q2 over 2n, and so on. Okay, so the conditions, the BPS condition, will hold block by block. <coughs> yes? Oh, it's like a, if you want to diagonalize a matrix, you can diagonalize it. In this way, being an anti-symmetric uh, uh, matrix, the, you can always bring it to the block diagonal form. That it has to be anti-symmetric, so each block has to be. Uh, you know that the blocks are only two by two matrices. Yes, you can. You can bring it. You can. I mean, you can always bring it like this. Then this this holds. If n is even, you can, you can bring it to this uh, this form. This is called uh, I forgot the name uh, Jordan form or something. Uh, I forgot, but it's something you, you can you can bring the the matrix to a two by two, two blocks of two by two. So. <coughs> okay, and so that means that that we will have the condition. That means we have the condition that I had there. Uh, what is it that I had here? The two M greater or equal than the QI. That will be the BPS. 
for each of the queues. <coughs> and Professor, can you, can you explain why again, you can have a single condition for each queue? Each queue, yes, because you can do the same analysis here for knowing that, that, you, that you have the, the Z diagonal. Okay, you have the Z to be I mean, diagonal in this way, in, in block diagonals. So you can do the same, anal the, 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 the same analysis I did that for each block. Okay, so I can define. Yes, for instance, yeah. So, and then, then, then it's, it will be just repeating the case of n equals to 2, block by block. Okay. okay. And uh, then we will have a possibility of satisfying the BPS condition block by block. Some blocks may satisfy it, and other blocks may not satisfy it. Okay. Okay, so then if if k less than n over two of the qi's are equals to two m, well, say work. K is a number, an integer less than uh, n over 2. <coughs> that means that then you will have 2n minus 2k creation operators. We have 2n minus 2k creation operators. And so we will have 2 to the 2 n minus 2k, 2 to the n minus k states. OK? So <coughs> the same, so for, for uh, you have a number of, uh, of the queues that satisfy, so you have only one queue that satisfies uh, this condition. That means that for only one queue, you have this combination to be zero, and that uh, <coughs> so then you will have two n minus one uh, states. And if okay, so uh, at the end the maximum value of k can take is n over two. So the, that will bring us back to the n minus n over two, which is n over two times two is n. So so that means that you, you will have the maximum number is when k is zero, is two n, and the minimum, minimum number is when k is n over two, which is Two to the n. Okay. So <coughs> these are um, so, so. Let's take for k equal to zero plus two to the two n, and this is the standard <coughs> this is the standard uh, long multiple. For k, uh, k between uh, 0 and n over 2, again, so we have 2 to the 2 n minus k states. These are usually called short multiples, and the size depends on the value of k. And for k equals to n over 2, which is uh, when you have all of them, so you have two to, the, two to the n states. And then this is what is called an ultra short multiple. OK? So this is another use of superlatives in supersymmetry. We have just super, hyper, and now it's ultra. <coughs> OK. Yes, we are competing with the comics <laughs> so to invent names for the heroes. So anyway, so this is what we have. Uh, so uh, the two extremes are the standard 
2 to the 2n that we, we found in the set equals to 0 case. And the smallest one is 2 to the n, which looks like the massless case, but there is also something in between. This, these are usually the, the ones that people are more familiar with. And this plays a very, very, very important role because of the size of the multiplet. And uh, <coughs> so let me just make some comments why this is important. So comments. <clears throat> there we have. As I told you, the BPS stays, so BPS bound. <clears throat> originated or started by BPS, of course, who were not doing supersymmetries, as I told you, but they were doing uh, in uh, soliton solutions. Of young Mills systems. So solitonic solutions like monopoles and so on. And uh, <coughs> yeah, so, so let me just be more explicit monopoles. And, uh, and then for which the bound was an energy bound. But I was finding like a mass greater than something, the bound was an energy bound. So the energy had to be bigger than something. Second comment, BPS states, especially the ultra short or short or, yes, ultra short states, they tend to be stable. because they satisfy the bound, all the masses have to be greater than something. And if this is equal to that something, that means that there's nothing lighter than them. So that there's nothing to decay to, essentially. So they tend to be stable. So that's, as particles, these objects tend to be stable, not to decay. Since they are lighter. Okay, the, for the BPS uh, condition or the BPS, uh, <coughs> for BPS states, what we were having is something like a mass essentially equal to charge. Okay. Mass equal to charge is something you have seen in some other parts of your life. Remember? I'm sorry? Black holes. black holes, exactly. So charged black holes, the this condition comes from the what what are so the call the extremal black holes. So you have seen them. So for the extremal black holes is when the they saturate the charge, the charge mass bound. So the so for BPS states there will be like extremal black holes and it's something 
that it also makes sense that extremal black holes become stable. The, the black holes start decaying until they saturate the bound, and after that, it stops decaying. <coughs> so it's a simple, it's a similar condition. So that is uh, also relevant in that regard. Um, also, BPS states have been crucial for understanding what is usually called S-duality or a strong weak coupling duality. Dualities in both, in field and string theory. And the reason is that uh, since they are short multiplets, so if there is, you find a property about them at weak coupling, you know that even if you move to the strong coupling regime, the size of the multiplet will not change. There's something cannot change continuously. So you keep properties of, of BPS multiplet at weak coupling, remain BPS uh, multiplet at strong coupling. So this property, which is very, very simple, is very helpful in understanding uh, strong coupling uh, field theories and also uh, spring theories. And uh, in particular, uh, you, have, you have heard about uh, uh, D brains in the string theory are BPS. Okay, so, <clears throat> so usually the BPS stays refers to, say, solitonic objects as, I, as they were discovered originally, and the deep, the deep brains in string theory are examples of that. So they are solitonic objects, and uh, again, they are important to describe non-perturbative effects. So that's why BPS states are so crucial, so they play such an important role, and they come out nicely in the uh, uh, extended supersymmetry. So, so this is one of the uses that I told you about extended supersymmetry as a theoretical framework rather than just trying to do a phenomenology of it. So, so you can have a good understanding of what uh, these states are and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and then uh, learn from them some of the properties that weak or strong coupling when you construct uh, field theories. So to finish, uh, so there are, in extended supersymmetry, there are uh, several types of states. The, uh, the long multiplets, which are uh, very heavy. So let me just summarize. So we have, if a uh, mass is less than 1 over 2n trace of the dagger set, there are no states satisfying that because of the, of the BPS bound. If is equal for all of them, so this will be our ultra short and uh, if it is greater <coughs> this band will be satisfied for some but not all of them so this will give us the short about in the extreme that will give us the long multiplets when none of none of the condition none of the charges satisfy this bound okay so this is forbidden this defines the essentially ultra short BPS states, and uh, essentially this will be, at, in the extreme case, the long multiplets. Okay, so these are heavier, lighter, and forbidden. 
Okay, so let, we'll continue next time. Uh, we'll finish this chapter already. This is the end of the chapter. So we'll start uh, next, uh, next lecture will be starting on the super fields and um, super space.